Hello everyone, and firstly, before I start, I wanna say how ecstatic I am to be speaking at the Agency Summit. I have to admit, I speak at a ton of events all over the world, both virtual and live, and often I'm speaking at a small business event and I meet an agency owner that really struggles with getting clients, constantly helping people realize the difference between the amazingness of what they do and every other agency. Because when you go to their website, often you see things like, I provide SEO, I provide social media, I provide pay-per-click, I provide email writing, I provide copy for websites, I do web development, I do videos for ads and commercials and all these sorts of things that really, truthfully, it, it overwhelms the client. And what the agency owner says to me is I'm sick of feeling like I'm in this constant hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set myself apart, trying to make the sale, and often feeling like people only care about one thing, price. Now, truthfully, these three principles are what are going to get you out of this hamster wheel. The problem is people focus so much on all of the functional skills, and even though, I mean, you're in marketing, often people don't focus on these principles for themselves. Now, I will tell you, even for marketers, these principles are hard for people to accept. I'm not saying they're hard for them to work because these principles are the ticket to rapid growth, but they're actually the things that most agency owners do not do, which is what leaves them stuck in that hamster wheel. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by starting with the story of Wendy, who is actually not in the agency space, but I'm choosing stories outside the agency space so that you can understand the principles, and then I can show you why this is even more crucial for the agency space. So Wendy was a language coach out of California and she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And while she had a successful business for a long period of time, charging $50 to $80 an hour, the problem that she found was there were people moving into California willing to charge $30 to $40 an hour for private consultation. On top of that, thanks to this new global economy that we live in, which agency owners absolutely live in, they were forced to deal with the fact that there were people in China offering to do it for $12 an hour on Craigslist. And thanks to our friends in Silicon Valley, they created technology. You know, I'll teach you Mandarin, you teach me English, we just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. Now, of course, with all the new AI products out in the, the world that agency owners have to deal with, it's very easy to see the connection here, right? We are constantly having to deal with the fact that people think they can do it themselves, or they think that they don't need an agency, or if they do, it's, they see it as a commodity more and more, which we know that that's not the case. Now, sure, we have to stay ahead of the technology and stay ahead of best practice, like anybody that's trying to be amazing at what they do and provide a great service. However, just like Wendy, she was struggling with the fact that there's technology out there, even though it didn't do as good a job as she did because she learned to teach Mandarin, other people felt that there really was no difference from a, I'm just meeting you and I don't know you from a bar of salt, just like I don't know that technology and I'm just gonna go with the cheapest solution. So she comes to me and she's like, how do I compete in this crowded marketplace? And what she was really looking for was sales techniques. What she was looking for was how to network more effectively, how to track obviously get people online to reach out, but more importantly, and what her real focus was, was when she actually got to have a conversation that that turned into a client. And she said, how do I compete? How do I get that structured so I close more and more deals? And I have to admit, in agency worlds, I see these ads all the time. I'll get you 60 appointments into your schedule every week so you can make money as an agency. My gosh, that means your closure rate must be horrific, or you've got so many customers exiting that you need that many appointments. Either of those are not great, and both of these problems will be fixed through this presentation today. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you feel for any reason that there's a reason for why this won't work for you, and I'm happy to explain exactly why. Connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an audio message after I accept the connection, and I will respond exactly why this fits your just in your own way. Because truthfully, so many agency owners are so busy. They're stretched between all the staff that they have to manage and all of these sales appointments where a lot don't close and a lot of clients are leaving that they never get to work on their business the way they absolutely need to. So 
What I suggested to Wendy is that if she fights this battle of competing on price and trying to close deals, it's a long battle to the bottom. And while I could teach her some sales techniques, the problem that she would have is that she would always not be as good as she could be if she avoided the battle altogether. So what I did is I looked at all the clients that Wendy would worked with over the years, and she had worked with hundreds. However, what I realized was there were two executives that she helped with far more than just language tuition. Now, these were executives being relocated to China, and I was blown away with some of the things that she did. I mean, she helped them understand the importance of reducing your accent, not just learning the language, because it really matters. Respect is so important in China, which is why she also taught them how to handle a business card correctly and why it mattered. And more importantly, the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world, and thirdly, I mean, this is huge in China, the importance of the difference in how to create rapport. See, if I was a really bad salesperson in America, in the US, in England, or anywhere really in a lot of the places in Europe, at the end of a 45 minute meeting, I might say something horrible, like, do you wanna move forward? And the customer might say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite, let me think about it, right? Now, if the customer still said they wanted to think about it, when I reached out to them maybe a week or two later, I know my chances of getting that sale are going down and down. Yet. In China, they're gonna to wanna to meet with you five or six times before they even discuss business. They're probably gonna to wanna to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. Now here's why though. They're talking 20, 30, 50 year deals. We're here, we're talking transactional, maybe 12, 24 month deals. So for them, the character of the person that they're doing business with is far more important than just the terms of the deal and getting the right price. And I was like, Wendy, you're doing so much more for these people than just language tuition. What are you doing? And she's like, well, there's just a few things. I'm just trying to help. She was stuck in her functional skill, just like so many of you are. You're so focused on all these amazing things you can do in the agency world. A lot of times you forget about the things that come naturally to you or how to explain the value of putting these together for a specific demographic. And I said, for these executives being relocated to China, Wendy, is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance that you're giving these people, they're going to be more successful when they go to China? And she's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? I said, great, so why don't we call you the China success coach instead? Instead of focusing on trying to sell, you know, hour by hour, China or Mandarin Consulting, instead, why don't you sell what we ended up calling the China Success Intensive, which ended up being a five-week program that she delivered to the executive, the spouse, and any children being relocated to China. Because the truth is, if the whole family isn't successful when they get there, then the chances are the executive is going to be pulled back to home to deal with things, and then eventually, they're all going to get back to their home country. So she loved the idea of this, but she's like, well, who do I sell it to? What she's really asking is, who do I network with? Who do I go out and meet? Who do I market to? And then, you know, obviously, who's gonna be the, the person that I speak to to get my client? And I said, well, who do you think it is? And she said, well, if I had to think about it, my ideal client is probably the executive. And I said, that makes sense to me. I mean, I was terrified going from Australia to the United States and people here speak the same language. Imagine going to China. I said, I just don't think it's your ideal client though. And she said, well, obviously the company would pay. And I said, yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, a lot of organizations have millions of dollars riding on executive being successful, so I can see them paying. I still just don't think it's your ideal client. Frustrated now, she's like, well, who then? And I said, personally, I think it's the immigration attorney. And she looked at me like I was speaking a different language. And I said, think about it for a second. These people make five to $7,000 for doing all the paperwork and all the bureaucracy that comes with organizing a visa. They also have to pay to get a client a lot of the time, which we all know isn't cheap. And then they've got to pay for office staff, they've got to pay for rent. I mean, they'd be lucky to make $3,000. I said, so why don't you just offer them $3,000 for a simple introduction that results in a sale for the China Success Coach? So she started going networking, reaching out to immigration attorneys, and they love the idea. They're like, double my money for a simple introduction? What do I have to say? And she said, all you've got to do is say, congratulations, you've now got a visa. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated across to China. And of course, the executive, overconfident, would say, yeah, I think we're great. You know, I mean, we've got our visa now, thank you. We've got our place sorted. You know, we're learning the language. Kids are getting pretty good at it too. I think we're set. And they just responded with, there's actually a lot more to it than that. 
I think you need to speak to the China success coach. Wendy would then get on the phone with the easiest sale in the world. I mean, these people were terrified to go. The organization was motivated to pay and they were recommended by their attorney. And she actually was able to charge $30,000 for doing this. Now that beats hustling every day to charge $50 to $80 an hour in a crowded market. More than that, after the attorney's fee, the, the commission she paid them, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world. That's the power of a differentiated and unified message. See, for Wendy, if she had have started with sales, she would have already lost. And that's why it's so vitally important that we stop selling on features, prices, and discounts. The truth is, people are actively looking for a message that they resonate with. For that, they will pay a premium. So you have to ask yourself, what is yours? What you've gotta be thinking about is what are the unique things you do outside the scope of your functional skill, and then what is the higher level benefit of that? See, for Wendy, it was rapport, respect, and e-commerce. And for that, the high level benefit was the China success or the China success coach. Now for me, I'm a business coach, I'm a branding expert, I'm a social media strategist, I'm so many things and truthfully, nobody cares. They don't care how hard it was for me to learn these things and they don't care how long it took me to learn these things. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy, the simplicity of that message gets me heard in a crowded marketplace. That is what sets me apart from everyone else. So if you're saying, oh, I'm an agency owner, everyone knows what that is. They put it in a bucket and they go, oh, I need agency help. How much do you cost? Now you're talking about price, you just met them. Or they say, oh, we've already got an agency, thank you. And now you're like, well, I'm different. I've got magic ruby slippers. Or you feel terrible trying to shove something down their throat that they didn't ask for. I know when I say I'm a sales trainer, people look at me like I'm a one step above a scam artist. When I say I'm in marketing, people say, oh, I need that, how much do you cost? But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy, there is no box to put me in. And because of that, they ask, what exactly is that? And I get to explain what that is with their permission. And what I mean by that is when I'm at a networking event, which is a good example, if I say I'm a sales trainer, they're like, oh, sales doesn't work for me. And now I've got to dance around like I'm different or try and get them out of that. But if somebody asks me what I do and I say I'm the rapid growth guy, full stop. Like I said, I was an accountant, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of that before. Tell me a little bit more. Now this only works if you are interested before you try to be interesting so that people are wanting to listen. But truthfully, it kind of works otherwise anyway because somebody always feels like they need to put somebody in a box before they can disqualify them or decide that they want to use them. Because when they hear something for the first time, which is naturally, our brain loves puzzles. That's why people use hook statements all the time in all this marketing messaging to get people to engage and lean forward. The problem with calling yourself an agency or a copywriting service or an ad agency is people know what that is and they immediately say, I need it or disqualify you. And that is what is getting in your way. Now that combined with a niche, all of a sudden allows you to break through the noise because unless you've got the budget of coca-cola speaking to everyone is speaking to no one and truthfully even if you've got the budget of coca-cola this is still ridiculously expensive see one of the things i find all the time especially in the agency world i mean if we talk about networking the truth is if you can't be the clearest you have to be the loudest so you have to be that person that goes and does transactional networking and says do you want to buy from me no what about you what about you what about you now firstly i i couldn't I couldn't handle doing that. But secondly, if I didn't do that, like everybody else that doesn't, they do aimless networking. What is it you do? Well, my day job is this. Right? If you're putting it down, like of course, that's why people think networking doesn't work and why they walk out with all these business cards of people, well, if they contact me, I'll work with them. But they never do, right? That's why we think networking doesn't work. And it's the same online. The truth is, if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest, which is why people are posting every day. They're doing a podcast episode every day. I mean, they're taking a photo of their donut or their dog just to post something on Instagram so they've got something to say so they can be the loudest. For me, I want to be the clearest so I can break through that noise and stop having to be in this ridiculous hustle. Now, if you want to really help your clients and they call themselves an accountant 
or a debt collection agency and you let them stay that vanilla, you don't give them their version of the rapid growth guide, the China success coach, so they're different and then niche them down so they come, they come across as the only logical choice, you are doing them no favors. You're forcing them into a box of being vanilla, which of course means they're going to pay more to you for services because they have to be the loudest, but also it means that eventually they're going to leave unless they luck out because vanilla combined with all the other people putting their vanilla stuff out is more expensive than it needs to be. Now, I want you to focus on niching so that it reduces the cost for yourself to get clients and makes it easier to keep them and so that you can do the same for your clients. But let me give you an example. See, a while back, I made the decision to start a new school. And the problem that I had is, I mean, firstly, no one trusts a new school. If you're thinking about a marketplace that is commoditized, I mean, that's definitely education. And truthfully, I had two markets to choose from. The first market was the market of people that wanted further education, people that had their degrees, but they wanted to get a higher level qualification. And they wanted that qualification to be respected. So no one's gonna trust a brand new school for that. You know, they wanna go to their boss and say, I got this further education, you know, give me a pay rise or give me a promotion. And a brand new school was always going to struggle with that. The other marketplace was really the marketplace of high school graduates, people that didn't get the grades that they needed to get, but now they were going to study somewhere to get their grades up so that they would be accepted into the university of their choice. Well, either market was going to require huge amounts of hustle every day. The market of further education meant that I was going to have to spend years just getting seen as credible. And the second market would just be this hamster wheel of getting students and then losing them as they went to the university of their choice. But then I discovered this market, the market of tradespeople. Now this is your plumber, your electrician, your tiler. I mean, for those people that don't know the trade industry well, these are the people that, I mean, they don't like school or they get bored with school. They're either really entrepreneurial and they wanna go out and make their own money or school had kind of let them down, they weren't doing well and so they made the decision to go out and get a job. Now, usually these people would go and do an apprenticeship and they would start that apprenticeship and well, let's just face it, they really struggle at the beginning because every time they make a mistake, the entire group of tradespeople around them will pick on them. They learn through sarcasm and aggression. I mean, it's a tough way to, to grow up and learn a skill, but that's usually what happens in the trade space. And then after years of learning, they end up the best person at that organization, or maybe the best person at one of the other organizations, but they look around and they're like, well, hang on a second, everybody around me, I mean, I'm better than them, but I'm getting paid relatively the same as what they're getting paid. So you know what? Forget this, I'm gonna go and start my own business. So they do, and they go and start their own business. And next thing they know, they've gotta find customers, but they do manage to get a few. But then they've gotta handle you know, customer service and wastage and other staff, and they've got no idea how to manage them. Oh wait, they do. Sarcasm and aggression, right? It's how they learned. But this is what happens. I mean, it leads to these businesses making very little money. I mean, truthfully, they need help. They need business coaching, but they can't afford business coaching. I mean. At the end of the day, a lot of these people are making less money than their staff, which really feeds into that sarcasm and aggression thing. So they think about where else can I go? They're not gonna go back to school. They, I mean, everybody has this view, especially if school had let them down, that if you can't do, you teach. So they didn't wanna go back to school. But we had a thought. What if we open an education facility with business coaching at a price you can afford? And what we thought about is if we did this, we could create a curriculum that suited them. So we built all of the classes like a mastermind, 20 tradespeople in every single class. And we ran it where we'd have a business coach trained educator. And that way people loved these courses. And as a matter of fact, it grew so quickly that while we started with just electricians, we grew out quickly to everyone on a trade site. And then we went, well, hang on a second, hairdressers and florists are tradespeople too. So we started working with them and we got 500 florists and hairdressers within a very short period of time. And then we actually had a call from the Australian College of Anaesthetists and the Law Institute of Victoria, where they basically said, well, hang on a second, doctors and lawyers are tradespeople too. I mean, they are. They may have spent five to seven years getting a qualification, but no one taught them how to run a business. So we started working with them as well. 
We grew to three and a half thousand students within the space of three years. Again, that's rapid growth by just deciding that everyone is not our customer. That's the decision we made. Everyone is not our customer. By doing that, all of a sudden, we went from being in a tough industry where we were really going to struggle to get anybody to take us seriously or being stuck in a hamster wheel to going, everyone's not our customer. We are business coaching at a price you can afford. We offer education to tradespeople and we had explosive growth. That is what you need to look at doing in your organization. From a networking perspective, it makes it super easy. Somebody asks you what it is that you do, and I would say, I'm the rapid growth guy. And when somebody says, what exactly is that? I can now speak to my direct niche, which is introverted service providers. And I will speak, instead of saying, you know, I work with this demographic of people that have this problem, even if they you know, feel like success in this area isn't really possible for them, I will instead talk about passion and mission. Because you know, everybody, especially agencies, do this all the time. What is it you do? Oh, I'm an agency and I, I work with, you know, this demographic of clients to help them grow their business. Or, you know, oh, we're an agency, so we do copywriting, we do ads, we do, you know, this, this, this. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you're just trying to sell to me. It's uncomfortable. And on, online, it's worse. You're like, Go click on the list of services and you're just overwhelmed by all this stuff people do. What I find is I try and remove all the complexity. Somebody asks me what I do, I just talk about my passion and mission for helping people. So I say I'm the rapid growth guy. And when somebody asks me what exactly that is, I say, well, one of the things I love to see more than anything in the world is an amazing introverted service provider with enough talent, skill, and belief in themselves to go and start a business of their own. But what I find more often than not is they get stuck in this endless hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale really feel Feeling like people only care about one thing, price. Do you know anyone like that? Now, of course, if I've done my research, which I don't know why anybody goes to a networking room without planning beforehand and knowing who's going to be in the room, so that that be feels like a pre-planned meeting as opposed to you just winging things and ending up talking to someone that sells insurance. So you always wanna do your planning before you go, but when I say, do you know anyone like that? They say, well, yeah, I'm like that, or I know someone, of course. And I say, well, I'm on a mission to help these introverted service providers realize they're not second-class citizens, their path to success is just different. But the success comes from focusing on three things outside the scope of their functional skill that will really allow them to create a rapid growth business that revolves around them, their family, and their life, not the other way around. Actually, let me give you an example. Maybe I'll tell the Wendy story. Now, the clarity of that, firstly, notice, I'm not trying to sell them anymore. I'm not sounding like, hey, I do this functional thing. I'd love for you to buy that off me because I'm trying to buy a new car and you, know, you paying me will help me do that. Instead, it's I'm on a mission to do this. I love seeing this, I hate seeing this, and I'm on this mission to make this change in the world. The difference in explaining that makes a profound difference in the networking room. But then, because of the power online these days, I mean, you know this, as soon as you get a message that's clear, that breaks through the noise, you don't have to work as hard to get your message out and attract your exact right clients. In fact, you can get your clients to chase you. The problem is that people get stuck on the misconceptions of niche marketing. You do not need to fire your current clients. You don't need to say, hey, you know, I've decided that I'm going to focus just on, in my case, introverts. I'm not gonna work with anyone else but introverts. Because you don't have to fire your current clients. They think you're amazing. They don't care if on your website you start calling yourself a dentist. As long as you still service them and give them value, they will stay working with you. Now, you also don't need to turn down referrals because the truth is, again, somebody that knows, likes, and trusts you referred you, and if they come to your website and you start calling yourself a dentist, they are not going to care. They are just going to say, hey, can you still help me, right? Niche marketing is a new marketing initiative. It's about attaining new clients. That is it. So what I want you to think about is which niche makes the most sense for you and realize that you don't need to say I work exclusively with all you need to do is say I specialize with for instance when I started I started in this new industry saying I specialize with helping introverted business coaches then I started saying I specialize in helping all introverted coaches then introverted professional service providers, then introverted service providers. Now, in a lot of ways, I help introverts right across the board. 
However, if I had have started with that broadness, I would never have got the opportunity to work with the clients and create the success that I needed. Because truthfully, if you've got less economies of scale, less proof of concept, less success behind you, you can't be going vanilla against vanilla like everyone else. All people will bargain you down with price. You have to be the cheapest if your message isn't clear and you don't have the success other people have. But even if you're successful, why would you do that? Even today with my brand, I mean, my books have sold almost 100,000 copies and they're in 16 languages. And I still focus on just introverted service providers. Now, agencies quite frequently will say, yeah, but I, I can help so many other people. Just because you can doesn't mean you should, and no one else is going to believe you. You have to say, I specialize with this group. That group will see you as the only logical choice. And just like you go to a doctor and they refer you to a specialist, you assume that specialist has got a better general knowledge than everyone else. It's the same when you go to a person that specializes with introverted service providers. People still assume you've got a great knowledge of marketing and sales, all the same, because all it means is specialty means that for this group, I have a unique ability to help them. However, for everybody else, I'm as good as everyone else. I'm just as vanilla. That gives you a huge advantage for that sector. Now, just so you know, small business owners or women, that is not a niche. That's a huge group. When you start and even as you grow, you want to go smaller than that. The number of people I see launch into the introverted space and they start with introverts. I don't even focus on all introverts. Well, I didn't up until recently. And yet they're starting without a book, without all this success behind them in, a broader, in the broad market that I am now in. Now, does that mean I don't work with companies that aren't introverted service providers? Well, of course I do. I have, I have extroverts that I work with because they gravitate to the systems mentality that I love to share. I have worked with product-based companies. As a matter of fact, some of the biggest billion dollar product companies in the world are on my client list and come to me for advice on a regular basis. But my website says I specialize in helping introverted service providers because my new market acquisition strategy, anything that I'm not doing through cold calling or through referral and repeat business is focused on that niche so I can break through the market in this crowded world that we live in and still have people People book calls for the opportunity to work with me months in advance and still show up and still buy and my closure rates through the roof because of the success I have on speaking to my niche. And everyone in the agency world can do it. However, more often than not, they overcomplicate things or they avoid doing it or say, I'm gonna choose six or seven niches because they're trying to hedge. You get one, make it small, build success there and build momentum out from that point. But all of your current clients, you're not gonna lose them and most of you only get clients through referral and repeat business unless you're spending money on ads and all of that still would be better from the ads perspective to focus on a niche and from referrals and repeat business, they don't care, neither should you. So what I want you to do is think about what the unmet need is within your market and how you can service that. Now I've seen people that focus on what I call outcome niching, like I help people obtain rapid growth. So if you're getting your business ready for sale, perhaps that's not important to you. If you just want, you know, relatively, you know, relaxed growth, I'm not your person, but I focus on rapid growth. That's what's called an outcome niche. There's also what I call industry niching, right? So I focus on introverts. As a matter of fact, I focused when I started on just introverted business coaches. For agencies, my recommendation is think about either the unique outcome that you can provide and then attach that to an industry niche that gives you the opportunity that, to provide your best results to them. Or start with an industry niche, but go super granular and then think about the outcomes that you can provide them. But either way, you wanna focus on making sure that you speak to one niche and say that you specialize in that niche and you will watch your business create explosive growth. However, to do that, what you need to do is learn about sales systemization. And the best way I can talk to you about that is actually by sharing the story of Derek Lewis. See, when Derek first came to me, and those people that have read my book, this name might ring a bell, but when Derek first came to me, he had a pretty significant issue. You know, he just believed that no one could afford him. And funnily enough, I mean, he charged $20,000 for doing a ghostwritten book, yet the industry standard is closer to 55 dollars thousand, 60,000 these days even. Yet I said to him that, and he said, well, people can't afford 20, I, I, I can't charge 60. So I said to him, you know, let's take a step back for a second. Help me understand, you know, how you came to this realization. He said, well, what happened was 
I was lucky enough. I, I know how to use you know, Google AdWords and I was starting to get, I, I got some leads. And what would happen is people would reach out to me, we'd have some dialogue, and then eventually they'd ask me the price. And I would respond and tell them the price and, and then I wouldn't hear from them. And, or they'd tell me it was too expensive and they, would just, they were going with somebody else. And so I determined that people couldn't afford me. I said, so what did you do? He said, well, I got tired of people wasting my time. So I put my $20,000 price tag on my website. And I said, well, how did that go? He said, well, not, not great. He said, well, now no one contacts me. I'm like, okay. I said, so let me ask you a question because for you, you've decided that these people can't afford you. And actually, this is a really good piece of advice for anyone that has sales teams. Whenever somebody gives me an excuse for why something's not working for them, I'll always ask, when did you decide that? Because a lot of times that decision of people can't afford it actually could be for a thousand other reasons. They've just decided that themselves. And that's what I said to, to Derek. So it sounds to me that you've decided that people can't afford it. However, I wanna ask you a few extra questions. Is that okay? And he said, I mean, of course he said yes. I mean, the guy had made $27,000 in 2013. And by October of 2014, when he reached out to me, he made $27,000 for the whole year. I mean, he said, you know, just as well his wife had a full-time job, otherwise they'd have no health insurance and they'd be in a real bind. I said, okay, so here's what I wanna ask. I said, you said that people reach out to you. How do they reach out to you? He said, well, they reach out on my contact page. I said, well, how do you respond? He said, well, I respond with email. I said, so what then happens? He said, well, emails go up and back and they ask questions. I answer them, I ask questions. Turned out the entire dialogue happened via email. Until, of course, you know, they asked the price and then you know, he responded with the price tag. And that's how he decided that people couldn't afford him. And I said, Derek, remind me what it is that you do. He said, well, I'm a ghostwriter. I said, okay. So what do you think your clients don't like doing? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a ghostwriter, Derek. What do you think your ideal clients don't like doing? He said, well, writing. I said, and yet you're corresponding with them with all of these emails over and over and over again. See, quite frequently, we turn the sales process into what's comfortable for us, but we need to look at how we can structure the sales process that's best for them. I said, I don't care if you charge $20 for the book. I mean, I know what you do is more valuable, but if the experience of buying from you is this idyllic, why would I want to, to work with you? I don't care if it's $20,000 or $20. I wouldn't, I'd go with somebody else. I'd say it was too expensive. So here's what I want you to do. If you say people aren't paying $20,000, we may as well put your price up to $50,000. So we did. And I said, but when the next person inquires, what I want you to respond with is just this. Let's call the customer John. John, thank you so much for reaching out. I just checked out your website and it looks like you're doing some amazing things. As a matter of fact, I, finished, I just finished working with someone very similar to you and we had an amazing working relationship. However, with a ghost and an author, it all comes down to relationship, which is why I'd love to get on a call and make sure that you and I are a personality fit. I also have a few questions that I need to ask you in order to be able to give you a more solidified price. Below is a link to my scheduling app. Feel free to book a call. Well, the first person that reached out to him did book a call. And within the space of just 40 minutes, he managed to get a deal for $40,000. As a matter of fact, within six weeks, he'd managed to get a second deal and get up to 80. By the end of the year, he made $120,000. Now, that is the ability to have a sales system that works. And as a matter of fact, his success continually grew and grew from there, and that's when, and I apologize, I said that he was charging 50. We put his price to 40, and then we moved his price up to 50 shortly after that because his closure rate was so, so high. Now, people, when I say this, say, Matt, is that why he ended up on the cover of your book? Now, I know that sounds like a great reason to put on him on the book, and, and truthfully, it was the reason why I decided to work with him on this book because he said, Matt, you need to put your ideology into a book. And I've been telling people for a long time that somebody needs to create a book for introverted sales professionals and introverted business owners. And as a matter of fact, when I said it, I meant anyone but me, because I used to deliver this presentation. And quite frequently, I deliver this presentation at events where I was talking about differentiation, niche marketing, and sales systemization. And People I would resonate with it, but they were like, well, could I really apply this to my unique business? 
And could I really do it myself? And what I realized is that I built myself up to be this amazing person that, you know, it looks like success was just something that I was always destined to achieve. And what happened was I made the decision that I had to put this story of my humble upbringing. I mean, when I was in, in high school, I had, I had the reading speed of a sixth grader. I was super introverted. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. It was only when I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which basically meant that I put on a, a pair of funny colored lenses and, and miraculously I could learn to read. Now I couldn't learn to, to read like everyone else, but I could start the process of learning to read. Well, what happened was I, I, I hustled for the, the last two years of high school and I actually got into the top 20% of my state, but then because I was just, I mean, my family could see I was exhausted. We all agreed I was going to spend, you know, a year finding myself to work out what I wanted to do before I went to university. So the pain was worth the gain. So I wouldn't drop out. Well, I took a job at a real estate agency. And, and before you think I was the guy out selling, I was the guy in the back office with this look on my face saying, you know, don't speak to me. I'm, I'm here to find myself. I was just doing data entry. But three weeks into that job, my boss pulls me aside. And he's like, Matt, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we just got a call from head office and they're shutting down this premise. I mean, you're out of work. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay. I'm three weeks in, I've got nothing lined up and this is Australia at Christmas time. I mean, we go on holidays on the 20th of December. And we don't come back to the 15th or 20th of, of January because we're having our, our holiday season for summer and for Christmas at the same time. So the only jobs I could find were these three roles that were called commission only sales roles. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to apply to these, but I don't want to tell my father who broke his back 80 hours a week that I was out of work. So I applied for all three jobs and I got three interviews. And then I went to both all three interviews and I actually got three job offers. And while I was very uncomfortable about selling as, as, as an introvert and being really uncomfortable, I was like, maybe they see something in me that I don't see in myself. Well, that was put to rest really quickly. I, I remember going into my first day and being a little bit confident and the trainer said, Matt, I mean, they just hire everybody. I mean, we've got this saying, we throw mud up against the wall and we see what sticks. It's a fun saying until you realize that you're the mud, right? So anyway, after five days product training and not a single second of sales training, I get thrown on this road called Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia, and I get told to just go and sell. I mean, I didn't even know what to say. I mean, I took a deep breath before my first door, and I was luckily enough politely told to leave because shortly after that, I was less politely told to leave. I was sworn at. My personal favorite was always getting told to, to get a real job. And I mean, this was the only job I could get, right? So door after door, this happened until my 93rd door where I made my first sale. And I, I remember I made about $70. And I mean, I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds until I realized I gotta do this again the next day and the next, and the whole idea of that wasn't okay. So I made the decision that sales had to be a system because without that, my year was gonna be terrible. And I'm like, well, where do I go and learn this system? Well, I couldn't exactly pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book because I mean, it would have taken me a year to, apply, to read it, let alone apply it. But what I did discover was YouTube at the time. And I typed in the word sales system and all these videos came up. And every day I'd spend eight hours applying what I learned and then eight hours learning the next step in the system or perfecting that step every night. And that would just happen for day after day, week after week. Well, I started to get better. As a matter of fact, six weeks in, my manager pulled me aside. I mean, I'd gone from 93 doors to a sale to 63 to 21 to 18, down to nine, down to three. I was making so many sales that my manager pulled me aside. He's like, Matt, we're, just, we're blown away by this. We just printed out our, our national sales figures. We get them, back then we only got them once a month. He said, it turns out you're the number one salesperson in the company. I mean, that took six weeks from having no business being in sales, from terrified to being in sales, to teaching hundreds how to do it because they put me in a training position to train a bunch of people. Now sure, there was a hiccup where they gave me a team and I have no idea why they think just because you can sell, you, you can train and you can coach and you can lead. I had no idea. But I mean, I got given a group of 20 people as a training group. They all quit on me. Back to YouTube, learn how to manage, learn how to lead. And I started to get great at it. I got the opportunity to teach hundreds. Well, fast forward just about a year later, I'd started up my own business, a telecommunications company of my own. And it grew to being the fastest growing telecommunications company in the country, the fastest growing independent brokerage in the country within the space of about 12 months. And within the space of three years, it was turning over $4.2 million in that year. Fast forward just shy of a decade, I'd been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. So Derek said to me, 
with all the help that you have given me and all the success I, you know, the, that you've built into a system and all the success you've had, you've got to put these ideas into a book. So we agreed that we were going to work on a book together. But that is not why he ended up in the book. The reason why he ended up in the book is about halfway through the writing process of the book, he said, he reached out to me and he said, Matt, the market's changed. I'm like, what do you mean the market's changed? When did you decide that, right? And he said, well, you know, I'm reaching out, you know, I'm having the same emails, I'm having the conversations exactly like what you suggested that we do, but now all of a sudden, the customers are ghosting me. I'm like, what do you mean ghosting you? He said, well, you know, they're not responding to me after I give them the proposal. Well, firstly, I used to close a lot more on the spot, but now I'm having to chase these clients. I'm having to, having to reach back out to them and some aren't even getting back to me. So the market must have changed. I said, are you doing everything exactly the way I told you to do it? Exactly the way we, we built it out. And he said, yeah, exactly the way. I said, really, exactly? He said, well, I may have changed a few things. He'd actually changed everything. I started to realize that what had happened, and don't get me wrong, you are allowed to change the sales process, but one thing at a time, you've got to treat it like a, sales ex a, a science experiment, right? You've got to say, change this one thing and see what happens, and then change one thing, another thing. He was changing multiple things all at once. As a matter of fact, he had no idea what the original process was or when it last started working when it last stopped working. So what I said to Derek is we need to go back to the last process we know of that did work. Well, funnily enough, as soon as he did that, he made a sale and he got a $50,000 book project that took him to Switzerland. Just shortly later, he got another deal that took him to London. It was the first time he got to take his wife to, to London. Now, if we fast forward through to today, now this is mid-2013. If we fast forward through to today, now this is mid year 2023. Well, Derek is now already booked out till next year and he now charges $130,000 for a ghost written book. That's miles beyond what he ever used to charge and he's in a situation now where he's booked out until next year. So what I really want you to take from this is the difference between sales success and sales failure can be one simple thing that you're not seeing. And that is why it is so vital to understand the principles of rapid growth. So many agencies are in this situation where they believe that it's just a tough market and they have to stay the best in the business at all of these things. The truth is, if you know these three things, what is your differentiated and unified message? What is your niche? And then you have a sales system that works, you can have a rapid growth business. The problem is that most of these are basically forgotten. They're not done. They're not focused on. Focus on these three principles and you will create a rapid growth business and break free of those barriers that show you or make you think that you can't. You really can obtain success. Abraham Lincoln used to have this saying, give me six hours to chop down a tree. I'd spend the first four sharpening the ax. Most business owners, what they do is akin to just keeping on chopping. It is absolutely vital that we sharpen the ax. And because you're in marketing, you know, it's, it's the whole old saying, of, you know, the cobbler has no shoes. You have to make sure that you get these three principles right and then help your clients get these right so you can break through the noise without as much hustle in a much more cost-effective way. Now, if you want to create your own differentiated and unified message and discover your niche, I would suggest, you don't need to hire me for this, go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth and there you'll be able to download a template that will break down the process of creating this. It's a five-step template. You know, I did this at the National Freelance Conference a while back and nearly 200 people in the room. And at the end of the session, I said, look, do me a favor, put your hand up if you now believe you have your own differentiated message and your own niche of willing to buy clients. You know, a, a message that will excite and inspire people to want to know more and a niche that you've identified of willing and wanting to buy clients. 97% of the room put their hands up. But then when I said, look, do me a favor, just keep your hand up if this is the most time you spent on marketing since you started your business, actively doing it. I mean, you guys all know, you guys, you girls, you all know marketing, but actively applying it to your own business and taking the risks you need to, like choosing a niche and choosing to specialize. Well, 85% of the room kept their hands up. The whole session was 90 minutes long. So the key is that this absolutely works if you do it. So go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth and download this template. And I would recommend doing it with somebody else that's not in the agency space so you don't get stuck in your functional skills. But you can download it at matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. Now, if you're an introvert, 
Also, I would highly recommend you go to the introvertsedge.com. There, you'll be able to download the first chapter of my book. My publisher hates me when I say this, but you do not need to buy my book. If you go to the introvertsedge.com, you'll be able to download the first chapter. There you'll find the seven steps of the sales process. If you do nothing more than grab what you currently say and put it into that system, then you'll quickly realize there's some things that don't fit. There's some things out of order. Fix that, throw the things out that don't fit. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. And then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, usually around telling great stories, like my version of the Wendy story, and asking great questions. If you do nothing more than that, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. Now, of course, you can also go to theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking, and there you'll be able to download the first chapter of my networking book. And I just wanna say to every agency out there, you really can have a rapid growth business doing what you love. And while there are so many of you out there with all these skills and you are often just competing on price, it doesn't have to be that way. But all of you aren't competing. You can all have your own niche. You can all have your own version of the rapid growth guide, the China success coach. And you can all create your own sales system that works. And then you'll find you get customers cheaper that also your closure rate is higher as well as you'll be able to retain them more effectively. So it was wonderful to speak to you. And again, if for any reason you feel like none of this applies to you or you don't know how it applies or your brain is stuck hitting you up against a barrier, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a connection request. And then when I accept, you'll be able to send me an audio message asking your question. I'd be happy to reply to you there. But I would really recommend just start by going to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth and doing that template. You'll find you'll be miles ahead just be doing it. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing all of your great successes, and enjoy the rest of the summit. Cheers all.